Mark's Classic Rock, Q1043. Joining us here at Q104.3, someone who's been up so many times, Eddie Izzard. The remix, the first 35 years, a world tour. You're at the Beacon Theater, September 20th, 21st, and 22nd. Welcome back to New York City. Thank you very much, Ken. Yeah, it's great to be back. Well, of course, I was there in New York not that long ago with great expectations. Just I did uh, see that. That was yeah. wonderful. You, that I was loved your a, Miss Havisham. That was quite impressive. I loved uh, loved doing it. And as you know, I played all the characters and New York critics loved it. And so it's an unusual thing for a British person to start in New York and then go back to London, which we did to rave reviews as well. So I'm very proud of that. And Hamlet's coming up for next January. But right now, it's the first 35 years of my stand-up, and which seems like a long time. But um, as you know, the story just come out. They've got 55 years now of career. I was... I was just going to say to you, just we premiered the Stones album this week, still going. I saw Bruce Springsteen at, at the Giants Stadium, 80,000 people singing every song every night. He's done 40 shows, doing three and a half hour shows. And you know what? This is your, this is your classic hits. And I've cherished all of it, the stories. It's funny, before, like big time, a well, long time DJ, but when I was doing stand up, and one of the first tours I had was opening for a band. And it was just a, a local tour. And one of the guys in the band said, you do the same jokes every night. Like, you, you play the same fucking songs every night. Well, I have to write a new act, but you get to play your, 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 your hits. Wait, what is, that doesn't make any sense. We're entertainers. Does your guy write a new show every single night, write 20 new songs? But we love this stuff. You and I have talked about Python all the time, how... They came back when they did a classic, would they play Wembley or something? They played some giant place doing their classic sketches. Mick is going to sing Satisfaction. Bruce did Born to Run. And Eddie is going to do the canteen on the Death Star. Yeah, yeah. That's this. It's weird that with bands, it's like a standard. And also, I think people get pissed off. I've heard of bands that sometimes said, I refuse to play any of the tracks from before, and that the audience don't like that. But with stand up, we're in this odd place where <laughs> it's kind of encouraged to do new stuff. But in the old days, as you know, it must have been in the same in America as it was in um, Britain, they, that certain well known comedy people might have the, a, a stage show that they did that they would tour around, and they have the same one, same hour that they do for 30 years. We had a very famous double act called Morgan and Wise, and they did the same one-hour sure. show for 30 years. And um, now it, we have more gears. We've It's basically, as of the, at the late 80s, turn of the 90s in Britain, we started deciding to change our material over much faster. And I think the same revolution happened in America also, the idea of changing things over. And I don't write any of it. I, I sort of workshop it into into shape I, in different languages now. The last show of Wunderbar I did, I workshopped in French first and then in German and then in English just to uh, because I was against the idea of Brexit, which has put the country into a difficult situation. Back to home. say the but, least, um, to say the least. Yes, <laughs> but um, it, uh, it seems we got done by Brexit. Um, but anyway, that's not in play for this general election. So right now I'm doing this tour and then I'm going to be in politics for hoping to be the next MP for Brighton uh, Pavilion, which is a, a constituency, a seat in Brighton, the city of Brighton, which is kind of like London by the sea. Great. I, Eddie, Eddie, well, I was just there two weeks ago. Um, and I've just, we, it was bucket list of bucket list trips for me. You know, I'm a Beatle geek in Abbey Road for a birthday party for Billy J. Kramer, a dear friend, big party. And I was asked to host it because I've known him and did that I, again. If, if Charlie called and said, do you fancy a cuppa? I was like, no, thanks. I've got to go to Abbey Road to be in that room where this magic happened. I, I've done this for 40 years. I was shaking. My heart was pounding to be in that room. And then to relax, we went down to Brighton and got some cool mod clothes and you know, as everybody told me, it, it, the gay community and dogs saved all of Brighton. It is such a beautiful, it reminded me of kind of like a British Key West, if you would. Yes, um, I haven't, uh, I know of Key West and I haven't hung out there so much, but uh, is Key West kind of a groovy, very groovy area of Florida, is it? Exactly. You know, a rundown area. It ha in, in New Jersey, Asbury Park was run to 30 years. It looked like it looked like a, a, an atomic bomb. It looked like an, an area of the Ukraine does right now. Burned out hulks. The gay community came in. We have restaurants, beautiful places, sports. There's a beautiful hotel. And 
you know, that moment of when a community, I don't care who it is, comes in and rescues a neighborhood and makes it beautiful again. Like, oh, cheers. You know, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The whole LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus community in, in but it's very strong. There's big gay pride, which we had in a, in a, a storm. It's like one of your storms. <laughs> Normally in America, you do storms better than us. But we had a pretty big storm. And I remember the TV cameras, because I'm a bit known in Britain, and they, they, they said, we're going to interview you. So I thought, I better just face into the wind, otherwise my hair would be all dirty. <laughs> and I thought blowing back off my face would be the best look. So, yeah, I have to think about these things for television. But yeah, and I was very impressed that not only all the people who went out in the in the in the pride parade but also the the people from brighton and from surrounding brighton who came in there and was waving in the howling rain and wind and, awesome. um, so that was that was great so yeah and i grew up in east sussex which is the county that brighton is in and in the years i've been there for 300 years or more so um it's it'd be great if i can i have to do a lot of hurdles to get through uh, primaries and things like this to get through to become the MP in Brighton. That's what I'm pushing for. But meantime, I am touring uh, America and Canada and back in New York. It's great because, yeah, New York is very close to my heart. I've been there for long extended periods of time, so I feel like um, um, I think you have to be made an honorary New Yorker, but I'm, I'm sort of trying to make myself an honorary New Yorker. I feel, you know, the zeitgeist of New York, the zeitgeist of London, Paris has also got it, Berlin's got it as well. You know, there's a number of cities that just have this feel on the yeah. street, groovy out there, different thinking. I, you know, it was McCartney and Lennon, you know, when they, when they always said like they felt that this was home for them. There's a comfort factor that they always got went like, yeah, this is this is a comfortable place to live, even though you're iconic and you will get recognized. But, you know, the last time I saw McCartney he was coming out of Central Park with a towel and he's just gone for a run and holding a pole in spring, not a person with him. You know, just, he wanted to just be a human being for a minute, not have that phalanx of, you know, that sort of thing that I think New York affords you because you there's a celebrity around the corner. It's not that, I mean, it can be, but if, if somebody's always around, it's what, how Springsteen's lived his life in Red Bank, New Jersey. He goes shopping and he goes for bread. So if you didn't see him this morning, you'll see him tomorrow. Hey, picking up the dry cleaning. And it's, you can hide in public a little bit. I think it's easier in New York, in, in London, Paris than it can other places. Yeah, no, it's great. I do like the big cities for that. And for the live and the live, what, what the cities, big towns and cities, they teach us these things. It can be a struggle, but they do teach us live and they live. People can come in from the surrounding areas where the politics tends to be more, um, more conservative with a big and a small, well, with a, with a big C, I suppose, of saying, I am this and I don't meet any other people who are, we are all <laughs> this right here. And then you go into a city and you go, oh, there's those people are those people, these people are these people. And, oh, we're interacting now. Oh, hello, excuse me. Yes. <laughs> oh, they seem very polite. And then you learn that, you know, there's a lot of different people in the world and we need to get on. We have to get on. Uh, and the towns, the big towns and the cities, they can, they can show us the way to make this century work. And so I say politically, 21st century, the coming of age of humanity, we've got to make this century work. We've got to make it a fair world for eight billion people or we're not going to make it kids it's up a, to us amen to that and to me you know it's like try to tell some stories on the air and share some joy and relax the burden and that's to me what comedy has always done and i've always been about storytelling whether it's you know from music from the beatles to my favorite comedians of you look back to lenny bruce richard Pryor, and you continue that of not just i mean look there's jokes and jokes are great and we've told jokes but stories wonderful creative stories so you're looking back on 35 years of your touring of comedy when you go back to look at it because i think about it when we, we were just talking about the stones as keith richards said you know i've played these songs for so long but if i have to stop and think about them i'm lost i'm completely lost if i think how does it go i just he said that there was a one of my favorite songs that the she's when he asked for she's a rainbow and mick put it in the set and i thought bloody hell that's that music box thing and he said, I hope the fingers remember how that goes. And he said, I just got on stage and luckily my fingers just played it, but I couldn't, I, I didn't have sheet music. I couldn't find it. So when you be, go back through your material, which I assume you did, how do you pick, like the Stones or McCartney or Elton or anybody, how do you look back on 35 years and say, okay, here's what I'm doing? 
Well, the brilliant thing that, uh, unlike uh, the Rolling Stones, you know, wonderful that though they are, they they are they are now three. They were five. They were th uh, three. They, they have to Heartbreak. choose. Yeah, it is it is tragic that that people have to go. Um, and but I suppose it's Keith. Is Ronnie allowed a choice in, in what they well, they they're coming out? They got, they got a new album, so that was a different thing. But when they're playing their live things, I assume they will play a live tour to go with it. Yeah. Uh, is is Keith uh, um, Keith Richards and uh, Mick? Are they the ones who mainly choose? They say, Ronnie, would you want? What do you want? And does Ronnie say, Look, you guys started this thing, so you have the choice. But I don't. I can just choose anything. So I can just say, Do this. I can change it in the moment. And when I went started going back through some of the pieces, some of them feel a little old. Now notes don't age. Licks, I don't think age in, in music, but. Some of uh, I, I was talking about this thing about taking blood pressure, which when I came up with it was with a squeezy thing. They put that thing around your arm, right? And you have a squeezy little bulb thing, and and that's how they did it. And now it's, they're all electronic, I believe, in in developed countries. Um, and that goes on goes, and it's a little machine. There's a little battery in it. Yeah, and it's fine. Uh, that's great. It does it, but it, it doesn't link to the material I did before. <laughs> so all I have to do is say this. This, this shows when I came up with it which was about, I don't know, out of 35 years, probably about 30 years ago. I'm talking about dogs and cats and things and bees and them finding nectar to make honey and the pollinization. So I do, I do like, I can draw back. I have remixed it. I have remixed the piece. So I have refound, done dip, found out different ways of doing things. And, so that's um, why it's called the remix tour. Got it. Yeah. Got it, got it, it got is, it. it. It's like remastered would be a, a band's doing it and they probably heighten the thing but they wouldn't remix it. well say madonna when she did like a virgin in, in a german uh 30s style and like yeah. she slowed it right down that's what i'm doing on some of the pieces uh just coming about them in different ways um when darth vader goes to the death star canteen he is uh, i'm playing around with what he says and sometimes it sounds quite close to what it was before, and sometimes it doesn't, and I'm adding in different things. Because if I can break up the, the rhythm of it, I, I can find something else out there. Um, yeah, I've already found new jokes about, about it was like I was analyzing how Darth Vader talked, and he doesn't do chit-chat. <laughs> if you think about it, there's no chit You've never seen a Darth Vader go... Everything's declarative sentence. So what's your name? Uh, uh, what's your name? Uh, um, Peterson. All right, Peterson. How you doing? Getting on okay? <laughs> All right, no, I don't smoke it. There's no chit chat. It's all we must kill them. We kill them. It's actually nearly all killing. We will kill them. Or oh, if they don't, we will kill them. Or I'll kill you. Or I'll kill these people. Then him. Then those. And and then we'll have some brunch. You know, there's no and, and no. Brunch. This is, is, this is, quite is, there, is there a health plan? I was on the floor. I was on the floor. Excuse me. Is there a health plan? Yeah. It's, no, it's, it's the it's, Death Star. <laughs> no well, it was, plan. it was, I'm your boss. Yeah. That, that <laughs> anyway, I'm trying to kill someone with a tray. Um, and Perfection. Actually, there was an interesting thing because I, I had this thing about, it was essentially a mistake that that sketch is a mistake about uh, it's a two person ego um, a status play between a Darth Vader who thinks he's a god, feels he's a god, and someone who's just who doesn't know quite who they are because they don't normally come in, in the canteen. And and they're trying to say, get a tray. And he says, I don't, I don't need a tray. I don't need a tray. I, I, as if it's some sort of thing. I can kill you without a tray. I can kill you with my mind, with a thought, with a. And and it goes on about this tray thing, and then he says, "Oh, the food! I put the food on there." All right. I see. Then he goes <laughs> off. And in in the early days when I came up with it, he, I used to go, "This tray is wet. This tray is wet. This tray is wet." Because all trays were wet at self service. Prices. And he's like everywhere, 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 everywhere. And it's because I know why because I used to work in the self service place, and they <laughs> used to wash the the. Uh, the trays in a dishwasher, they put them in racks. So they'd come out clean, steaming hot, but then they'd dry them uh, hor uh, flat, horizontally, and then all the water would c condense under there, and then you'd pick it up and it would, you'd have to do this every time. And I was in Raleigh, North Carolina, which we were gonna play in three days, I think. And um, I went and had breakfast in Raleigh, North Carolina, and, and waiting uh, staff there, one of them said, my boss keeps going, did you dry these things in a rainforest? What is that? Which is my line, which ended up in this guy saying in Raleigh, North Carolina. I thought that's amazing to come all that. <laughs>
But now most trays are dry, I think, because they actually dry them. I wonder if my sketch had a little thing to do with helping trays to be dry. And kids, <laughs> kids will never know the hell that we went through of the wet tray. Because <laughs> it was all these bloody... And you just, uh, God. Oh. Anyway. Priceless. So in this tour, do you, has do things change as far as, like you said, North Carolina? Does the material work better or worse? Other things connect like a New York to North Carolina or... Europe? All designed to work all around the world in either any language. So if it's Dark Vader, because in <laughs> France it's Dark Vader, not, not Dark, because the TH is made of all, for the French pronunciation package. And we all grow up speaking whatever we do, you know. The, the, if you're Spanish speaking, you can roll your eyes much easier. And French, there's certain ways of saying things that the English speaker has difficulty wrapping their tongue around. But they can't say a TH very easily. And so they, they call him Dark Vader. Instead of Darth Vader, it's dark. And they hit the dark as it sounds like an English word, dark. Dark Vader. And, um, yeah, so I can do that whole piece. Dark Vader, il faut avoir un plateau. A tray is a plateau. No, je veux avoir un plateau. No, c'est pas nécessaire. Est-ce que vous savez ce que je veux? Non, OK, est-ce que vous... Je suis Dark Vader, Dark Vader, Monsieur Dark Vader, le, 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 le senior Dark Vader. So I can do it in different languages. And all the stuff is designed to work in any city of the world, as long as the audience is kind of switched on. If it's a very mainstream audience, they won't get it. I was talking about the death of Caesar, and I was talking about Mark Antony advising him because chicken Caesar, it's all about chicken Caesar salad, which <laughs> um, is more famous than Caesar salad. And I said, why? <laughs> it's because he was advised by chickens. That's what Caesar, he had military <laughs> chickens. Who were, Mark, and I go into Mark Antony advising, going wah, 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 with a chicken <laughs> voice. So, and and I, some audiences, I think they thought, I would play to a very mainstream audience, and I think they thought Mark Antony, they're going, is this Mark Antony the singer, Mark Antony? I'm going, no. Oh, God. Not. Oh, God. You've got to get back to the Roman general. <laughs> Who are the Romans? Okay, well, uh, you don't know who the Romans are. This is we're lost on you. So it, it requires a certain background reading to come to my <laughs> which um, um, I yeah I don't want it to be like that. You know, it's not trying to be snooty. It's just you just got to be a bit switched on. You got to use your brain and. And that's that's how it works. If you know about some of the Roman times and seas, I go through the Battle of Alesia, which is a true battle, and uh, Versing Jeterix, who was a true Gaulish warrior chief and a hero to the Gauls. So Back anyway. to, to the early days, I remember the first, you know, in my first relationship to see you as a performer, the Trojan horse, you know, and I, you had me, you had, you know, like a love song, you had me at the Trojan horse, you had me at the guy cleaning the, the carpet in the Trojan horse. So I'm, I'm so psyched to see this show, the remix tour, the first 35 years. And you have to pick, you know, it, I, I was, we mentioned, I was at Springsteen talking with the guys before the show. They'd done 40 shows through Europe. And I said, okay, Europe, America, you're American, what? And they said, you know, we love America, but the audience is there to watch the audience is there and they enjoy and they do this when we play europe the audience is in the audience is part of the show they assume they're part of the show they yell they sing every word of every song he says you don't have to ever say clap your hands as soon as you do this there's eighty thousand people i have a theory on this actually i think it's the magical ocean this is my magical ocean theory i think the way Europeans get received in America is the way that Americans get received in Europe. It's slightly heightened. We can't believe that you guys have crossed the Atlantic, the magical Atlantic, the magical ocean, where people went off years ago. We sent you off in boats, and now you come back like this, and you all went to the moon, and blah, blah, blah. And then for us Europeans, I think America goes, you, you live in castles. You're all married to royalty. You all you, <laughs> you, you were there, the Romans. You're all Roman. You're all a thousand years, two thousand. And none of that's really true, but <laughs> the, the Atlantic makes you magical. So I find that the American audiences, for me, are even more heightened than the British audience, which are great. Um, but the American ones are through the roof. And and I think if you're American, you come up growing up through America, you go to Europe. We can't believe my God, Bruce Springsteen's here. That's crazy. I mean, the stones in America, it were the stones in, in Britain, it's, uh, but it's like, uh, <laughs> it's thing. and this is my, my theory is it's, it's the Atlantic is a magical ocean. The Pacific is not magical. It's too big. <laughs> anyone, if anyone comes over from, from Asia, they go, have you come from Mars? Have you come? Where the hell? It's it's that's too big an ocean. 
I mean, the fact that Hawaii is out there halfway across is like is like crazy. If you go back into the beginning of the Second World War, you know, Japan, the hellishness of them bombing Pearl Harbor um, and uh, all that stuff, it was halfway to America. It's still America was just miles and miles and miles away. Um, uh, so, yeah, the, the Pacific... The Pacific Ocean, or the specific ocean, as I call it, is uh, it's so large that no one can believe it. That's why they put Napoleon in the middle of it at the end. What put him in, <laughs> was it St. Helena? Just uh, this little tiny rock. Yeah. So Alba, couldn't... yeah. It was Alba, it was Alba. Yeah. Alba. Yeah, St. Helena was the first one. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we get our favorite stories, you know, again, just as we said, when they're putting together a set list, you know, there's so much of it has to be done, you know, whether it's the Stones or McCartney or Bruce, you know, there's so much when you've done that many years together of stuff that people love, you have to look down that list. I'm assuming you go, okay, well, these have to be in there. You know, they w it wouldn't be my, my, my hits, the remix, the first 35 years, if I didn't give them this many stories, if I didn't give them these pieces, but the rest you can kind of choose, you know, there's, there's that part of it that I think that is yours and the rest of it is ours. Well, there's a few because we people are less used to uh, comedians going out and doing the greatest hits, whereas it's de rigueur for the good um, point, yeah, for the bands. And if you don't do en enough hits, people are going to go, well, "What were you doing out there? Doing these new songs? I I don't know these. I haven't heard them a million times." So it's a slightly different thing for us. And and, and to be honest, I am choosing what the hell I want to do to out there. Excellent. And I could change it night to night. I could add things, and I could even come up with other stuff spinning off from the stuff and just. My, my commitment is to giving a whole night of, of, of good comedy, weird comedy, surreal comedy, intelligent, but surreal out there comedy. But what the hell comes out of me? I do have a, a list and Destar Canteen is the encore. Oh, but, whether I, but whether I walk off for the encore and come back on again, I don't know. So I started, <laughs> started doing these uh, uh, Carbon Zero encores where you don't walk off. You <laughs> just say, this is the encore. Imagine I've gone off and come back on. It's a lot of effort. Perfect. Then, by the way, the best story of that that I ever saw it was Stevie Wonder at the Garden, and he had finished. He had done the whole like talking book thing. He said, "Now I know most people go off for the encore and come back, but for me to get off this stage with sixteen people and come back is probably going to be about ten fifteen minutes. None of us want that. So let's. I walked off. I came back. Let's go. And went into superstition and brought the house down. Because no, he's right. He's in the middle of a keyboard. There's a thousand people on stage. It's going to take too long to get him off and back onto that keyboard. Much harder for Stevie Wonder than than, than, than Eddie is. But so I we am. get to see it. Beacon Theater, September twentieth, twenty first, twenty second. The remix. The first thirty five years. Oh God. Grab tickets. It's going to sell out soon. Um, I can't wait. Like I said, our our link. You know, it was George Harrison who said the spirit of the Beatles went into Python. And for me, the spirit of Python went into you. Well, thank you. That is a great honor. If, if, if part of that, if a thimble full of it went in, that would be a wonderful thing. It's true. I can't wait to see you. Safe travels and see you when you get to the city. Absolutely. New York's classic rock, Q1043.